Professor Pamela Snow. She is a speech pathologist, a psychologist. She's head of the Trogue Rural Health School. How have I said it? <laughs> In Bendigo. It's just got so many accolades, it's hard to actually paint this picture of the shining light that Pamela is. We all owe her a huge debt. Pamela also writes the Snow Report, which is one of the most read blogs in education, I think. Uh, certainly one of the best. So, again, when I say digitally, we're all digitally connected. Get onto the Snow Report if you can. Pam, um, um, please do come up. Thank you. <laughs> tweeting some of those pithy comments in difference to the suffering of casualties. But, but I can't think of anything that sums up our, um, the, the driver for our passion more than, more than that. So if you haven't tweeted that, get on to it. Um, okay. It's a great privilege to be here um, today at the launch of this most impressive, and you can see my, my copy has been on the bedside table and already had a glass of water spilt on it. So, um, it's, a, it's a true sign of a, a well read book. Most impressive and important edition to the knowledge base about reading. What it is, how best to approach it at a mainstream classroom level, and how to support those who struggle. To be asked by its highly respected author, Lynn Stone, to speak today is a particular honour, and I'm truly humbled to be able to say a few words and launch her book. Thank you, Lynn. It's astonishing, really, that we need to gather here at all today in 2019 to welcome a new book on the science of reading and reading instruction. In my lifetime time alone, we've put a few men on the moon. Some would say we should have put a few more on the moon, but I'll take that. We've seen enormous advances in computing and in medical science, road safety, aviation, manufacturing, you name it, and we've advanced in it, except that is in how we teach children to read. Mm -hmm. So why is reading important? I'm preaching to the choir here, but we can't remind ourselves often enough that reading is a basic requirement of 21st century life. Reading is life-changing and life-giving, along, along the lines of the title of Lynn's book, in fact. I can't imagine a life without reading, and of course none of us would be here today if not for some kind of fortunate confluence between genes and environment <laughs> that resulted in us undergoing the amazing, but as we know, unnatural transformation that is learning to read. Who gets to learn to read? Who misses out? Again, we know, and Lynn's already referenced this, there are inexcus inexcusable but explicable inequities in this space. Mm -hmm. Learning to read should not be a lottery based on who your parents are, what your postcode is, or what your teacher did or did not learn uh, about reading instruction at university, but a lottery it is. Why do we sell uh, teachers' family china out from under them? Teachers should be the most knowledgeable people in schools about what reading is, how to teach it, how to identify and support struggling students. Instead, teacher education stole their family china and replaced it with cheap plastic stuff that isn't nice to eat off and doesn't even look good. <laughs> the scary thing, as we stand here in 2019, is that in order to fix the current predicament, and again, Lynn's referenced this, within a generation, we need to start right now, today. Not next month or next year, now, because we have to turn around an ocean liner and I won't reference icebergs, in order to get ourselves back on course and be able to commit to a world in which every child, or nearly every child, should be, will be a reader. I have a mildly intellectually disabled sister who's 70 years old and has what I think would now be diagnosed as a developmental language disorder. She is functionally literate. As, as a function of the era in which she went to school. Some may prefer to pretend, and again, Lynn's referenced this, and we didn't confer on what we were going to say tonight, um, that there's no such thing as the reading wars. And uh, to which my reply would be, <laughs> it's naive and disingenuous in the extreme to suggest that the reading wars are resolved or over, and they most certainly were not resolved by that modern day Trojan force, balanced literacy. 
The debate may be resolved and the science in, but the war rages on. Such is the powerful hold that belief, ideology and tribalism have on the people's minds. Now, wars don't have a lot to recommend them. They are an incredible waste of human energy, resources, and creativity, and they divert energies away from progress that would otherwise be made. Imagine where we would be today if the simple view of reading had been the dominant frame of reference in teacher education since it was published in 1986. It may not be the final word on reading, but it certainly runs rings around the indestructible three queuing uh, predictable level text, banks of uh, decontextualised sight words. And isn't it ironic sending home lists of unrelated sight words when reading is meant to be a meaning based activity? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and of course, Lynn Court illustrates this point beautifully in her book with her little wind windings exercise. However, there is one silver lining to going to war, and that's the comrades that you uh, that you meet and you form un unbreakable ties with in the course of combat. Sometimes you're in the fray together, sometimes you're covering each other's backs, and sometimes you're plotting and planning from a secret bunker. Now, a few words about Comrade Lynn. I feel that I know Lynn quite well through her writings, not just this book, but also um, its companions, Reading for Life and Spelling for Life and of course her blogs and her tweets. But apart from today, Lynn and I have only physically met once before, and that was at, briefly at a research ed conference in Melbourne a few years ago. But such are the wonders of modern social media platforms that we gravitate to kindred spirits and learn an enormous amount um, from each other. And I know that because Caroline Bowen and I have never actually physically met until after we decided to write our book together. Um, and uh, that, that, that book came out of a, a Twitter exchange sparked by a, a speechy, I'm um, mortified to say, spruiking the benefits of astrological psychology for children with uh, reading disabilities. And, and Caroline um, uh, DM'd me on Twitter and said, we really should write a book about this stuff. And I said, yeah, we should. And then, uh, you know, domestic history, thinking that that was the end of the discussion. So, um, so the internet's not all bad. Um, now, Lynn tells me that her calling to this space goes back to her childhood, um, when even in primary school, she tutored struggling readers in her class, and later tutored the children she looked after when she was a nanny in her gap years. How fortunate were those, those families, hey? After she graduated and moved to Sydney, a job at Linda Moon Bell was just a natural ne next step. Lynn describes three aha moments in her career, and I'd like to briefly share those with you. The first one was when she began to realise that spelling errors were predictable. She said, having seen and analysed so many spelling tests that I began to, de I develop, began to de develop a feel uh, for how a person would spell almost any word based on a sample of just a few, it was almost like a, a party trick. This led to spelling for life, a nice party trick and thanks for the first book. <laughs> Another was the realisation that there was actually something wrong with how children were being taught to read and that it was not just a result of some deficit in their processing. And for me, this is all about the public health orientation of reading instruction, that what happens upstream, up the top of the cliff, is so important in determining what has to be done down at the bottom of the cliff. Um, and Lynn said, this was confirmed when I watched my first reading recovery session. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The little boy in the lesson couldn't perceive an embedded consonant and instead of chasing that down and fixing it, as I had been trained to do, the teacher just basically gave up. I've deeply suspected the program and its underpinnings ever since, and so I say all of us. <laughs> Thirdly was Lynn's connection to advocacy groups. She made a submission to the National Inquiry into the Teaching of Literacy and expected great things, but was disappointed, like the rest of us, to see that very little changed. She wasn't particularly affiliated to any organisations or groups at that time, preferring to operate independently, but reflects that when she joined Dyslexia Support Australia and associated groups, she realised that effective lasting change would not be possible would be possible through their work. So a few words before I end about this wonderful new book. It's accessible, informative and entertaining. And it's especially entertaining if you're a little bit in the know and get some of the references, which I think most people in this room will. It's carefully researched, it's wide-ranging and most notably of all, will have something for just about everyone who picks it up. 
What struck me as soon as I started thumbing through it was that this is a book that will get the novice in the reading science space off the blocks mm -hmm. and will value add the pre-existing knowledge of people who've been working, researching and advocating in this space for many years. And that's no small achievement. And if all of that is not enough, there's additional materials online. How wonderful it would be to see language for life, spelling for life, and reading for life embedded into teacher pre-service curricula. Mm -hmm. yes. I have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> so don't tell me the reading wars aren't a thing or that they're over. Neither statement could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. Ironically, one of the most important and powerful tools in this war is the written word especially the written word of reliable, well-informed and practice-based sources such as Lynn Stone. This book deserves to do very well and to, guide, to gain a wide readership across different background levels so that it can shift the needle on knowledge, practice and policy. We should all play a role in promoting its success. Now, the Twitter sphere is nothing if not an emporium of feedback, and this book has received a number of accolades on that platform, including um, these lovely words uh, that I've completely endorsed from Susan Godsland in the UK. And I don't know whether you saw her tweet then, but she said just a few days ago, it is a gem, not a single cliché sentence, written from a profound knowledge of language and experience of how to teach, of language and experience of how to teach reading, it is really a book that is both accessible and fresh. So thank you, Susan, for contributing to my speech. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to the fourth book in the quartet, um, Teacher Education for Life. Um, you didn't even know that you were going to write it. Um, but today is all about celebrating the great achievement that is Reading for Life, and it gives me enormous pleasure to declare this little red book launched. Oh.